Hi everyone, today we're going to talk a little bit about how multilingualism appears in some different contexts. Okay, so first of all, um, it's very common for people to be multilingual. When we look at the number of people across the world, uh, the majority speak more than one language. When we look in the United States, um, we have a multilingual society, but the majority of people are monolingual or only speak one language. Uh, so for us, when you grow up in the United States, if English is your first language, um, learning a second language doesn't start until school sometime, often, unless you have a nanny or a daycare or something that's in a second language. But for many people who grow up outside of the United States, knowing that you'll speak uh, two or three or four or five languages is just part of your everyday life. Um, so when we're looking at some of these places where new Englishes are in what we're calling the outer circle, it's very common for the individuals there um, inside of each person to also be multilingual. Um, and what's really interesting is that a lot of places um, live in harmony with lots of different languages. So sometimes we have a little bit of um, discontent in the United States as we feel like Spanish might be overtaking English or something, which it, it actually globally is quite the opposite. Um, or fear that um, we won't be able to communicate uh, with people the way that we need to, or they might not be able to communicate with the legal system or something the way they need to if they don't have enough English. So um, here in the United States, we kind of have an expectation that everyone will speak English, but in other countries, um, it's not an expectation that everyone will speak the same language. It often is an expectation that you'll speak two or three languages, and maybe you'll only have one language that's in common. Okay. So I want to point that out because that's uh, pretty common even though we may not feel that when we grow up here in the United States. I have a few definitions that we haven't talked about yet. Um, I could have included these in a different PowerPoint, but I want to go through these uh, definitions a little bit as we're talking about what it means to be multilingual and to have uh, languages come in contact with each other. Okay, so as two languages come in contact with each other, we talked about the word pigeon and then the word creole um, as children are learning the languages. And I want to talk about these three terms, which our Kirkpatrick book uses a little bit, and so I want to give a little definition to those. So a basilect is a creole um, that is least like the target language. Okay, and target language um, is a term that we use when we're learning a language. And in this case, sometimes people don't uh, actually want to be learning the language. And so the target may not actually be the goal. Okay? But so when English comes to some place, uh, let's say Nigeria, English comes to Nigeria, and there are people who are trying to speak English um, or have combined English with a little bit of their local dialect, and then this Creole emerges as children learn it, and the basilect kind is the one that is least like the English that first appeared. So whether that's British English or American English, um, it doesn't look like that at all. The acrolect is the, is the creole that's most like the target. So most like that English that came to visit um, in that area in Nigeria. Okay? And then the mesolect um, is all the varieties in between. So what that means is we can have an acrolect um, where it sounds the closest to the English that came, but then uh, we have the lowest variety, often the lowest political, politically, that is least like the, um, the super strata language um, is a term we've used before. And so those two often come kind of in conflict and people start to view one as being better um, than the other. And I mean the local people, uh, the people from outside are, are automatically going to view the acrolect as the, as the better language uh, because it is the easiest for us to communicate with. Okay. Um, but in between the basilect and the acrolect, there can be many different varieties or different dialects that occur um, in the middle. So they're not, um, you know, they can vary from being closer to the superstrata or closer to the substrata language. Okay. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about code switching. So code switching is what we do um, 
when we know two languages, but sometimes we interchange using one for the other. Um, it can be inside of a sentence, or it can be across sentences, like in a whole conversation. Okay, and there are lots of things about code switching that determine how we trigger um, the switch. So sometimes people trigger the switch because they can't, uh, there isn't a word in one language that clearly ex expresses what they're trying to express, so they may switch into the other language. Uh, sometimes they do it uh, because of uh, a feeling associated with something they're talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. There can be a number of reasons for why they might switch from one language to another. Uh, here's what we know about code switching. And it's important for you to know that the difference between code switching and a pigeon, right? The pigeon is someone trying to communicate um, and they may only know a few words in the language, so they do the best they can. Sometimes words from their other language might slip in there because they don't have the right word for it. Um, that is a little bit different situation than what we're talking about as true code switching. True code switching happens when the speaker or the writer knows both codes very well. Um, we often have in the past thought of this as, as some sort of uh, not full linguistic knowledge of both codes, that they might switch because the speaker lacked knowledge um, in what they were trying to convey. But as we have examined code switching more and more, um, and especially in writing and, and in speech as well, um, we can see that the speaker or writer uses grammar from both both languages. So they use both languages in a very high and complex way that shows that their competency or their ability in both languages is full, meaning that they are not a very low speaker in those languages. They're actually a very proficient speaker in those languages. Um, they can use both the grammar and the lexis or the word choices uh, from both languages and they can interchange them. And then sometimes we see it emerge as kind of a third code where it doesn't actually match the grammar or the lexis of either, either language, but it kind of starts to have its own um, and it can develop into kind of a third code. Um, the third code we often see more in writing our book gives us some examples of that as well. But I want you to understand that when people are code switching, um, it's because they are able to do so. And in order to do so, they have to have a very high knowledge of both languages. Um, that's necessary for them to be able to code switch. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what happens in a multilingual society with language choice. Uh, our book, our Kirkpatrick book, gave us the example of Malaysia and Singapore. So Malaysia and Singapore were um, more closely related um, and were kind of ruled by the same people. And in the country of Malaysia, uh, there was a language choice that was made. And they said, you know what, we want to work more on the Malaysian language, uh, Bahasa Malaysia, and so we are going to teach that in schools and that will be our official language. Now, the minute that someone decides that a language is the official language, it, um, it includes a group of people, right? It includes the group of people who speak that language, but it also excludes a group of people who may or may not know that language. And in this case, the people who lived mainly in the Singapore area uh, were of Chinese descent. So they did not know the language Bahasa Malaysia like the Malaysians did. Um, they were speaking Chinese instead. Now in Malaysia um, as well today, there are still Chinese speakers. Um, there's still a number of Chinese immigrants that are all across that area um, in different countries and and but Singapore decided you know if they're going to use Malaysian as the main language there then we actually want to break away um, from Malaysia to have our own language choices okay so in both places Malaysia and Singapore English is important um, but in Malaysia the main language is Bahasa Malaysia and in Singapore the main language is Chinese um, so choosing Malaysian actually pushed away the Chinese speakers um, and it's interesting to know that Chinese, uh, many Malaysians speak Chinese as a second or third language as well, um, some as a first language, but many people speak Chinese because Chinese is an important language in that region for trade. So um, many of those uh, countries that are in that area, Indonesia, um, Brunei, Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines, um, have influences of English and Chinese um, or have people who are learning both languages. 
uh, due to the influence of Chinese in the area. So Chinese is still a very important language in the area. Um, one reason why Malaysia may have chosen to uh, sort of elevate the status of Bahasa Malaysia is that when you make a language an official language, you're also saying that that language is important. And if language and culture are closely related, then you're saying that that culture is important. Um, and the people uh, react differently to that. So one way to make sure that a native language continues to exist is to use it a lot. Okay? Um, so here are some other language choices that we've seen show up in our readings. Okay? Uh, in many places uh, in Asia that we've been reading about, uh, they have an English plus one uh, rule, meaning that everyone in the country is supposed to learn English plus one other language. The, the other language is usually the native language they learn from their mom um, or their parents uh, after birth. And <coughs> English is the medium in school, um, or maybe English and one other language, depending on uh, regionally what language they speak. So you could actually have different languages taught in the same country. Um, but n each person would not know every single language that was taught in the country. Everyone would know English and they can communicate with one another, uh, but the other language would be taught would be their local variety. So in choosing something like this, what often happens, um, our book explains that we often see low literacy rates. So you may never learn to read in your native language. Um, maybe you use English for all of your higher education. Um, but in some cases, it leads to um, this policy leads to people being able to speak both but not being able to read or write um, in either one. And that can be an interesting uh, problem for people who live in that area. Okay. We also, um, when we choose, when we're making choices about language, sorry, I'm a visual thinker, so I sometimes close my eyes to uh, recall something that I've seen written somewhere. Okay. When we choose um, what language we are going to give value to, um, in some cases we may choose to support the local language. Okay. I spent some time in the country Estonia, and Estonia has a very few number of speakers, and they have survived uh, occupations by many different groups. And so many of the people inside of Estonia speak more than one language, um, but everyone in Estonia learns Estonian because they want to make sure that that language survives. So even though they have a very small population of speakers, relatively speaking, um, it is a language that they have always supported. Um, they have their own television stations where they could just watch Russian or English television or Finnish television. They don't. They have their own Estonian television stations and lots of support uh, for that language to make sure that it gets preserved. So supporting a local language is also supporting that local culture and that local people and it affects the way people grow up in terms of how they view themselves in the language. Okay? Lots of times language choice is made um, about upward mobility. So how will learning this language or this language affect the speakers in terms of what they're able to do in the future? Um, when we look at this happening with English right now, because that's kind of the language to know, in some parts of the world it's Arabic or Chinese. Um, even in the United States we view Arabic and Chinese as very important languages to learn right now. We call them critical languages in our education system. Um, what happens in these uh, countries that we're talking about though where the economic standard is not quite the same as the United States, is that we end up with a very small population of people who become the educated minority. Um, so when they use the upward mobility language, it can really help them to move forward, but often they move forward and leave kind of the rest of the people behind. Um, and so only a small percentage of the population becomes very educated in that upward mobility language. Um, it, again, it can vary from place to place, but these are some of the considerations that choosing a language uh, to learn in school and elsewhere in the community uh, can have an effect on the people. Okay, so um, let's talk about language in the classroom. Okay? So first of all, culture and language, we know that they're very closely connected. So um, when we make choices about language, we also are um, maybe 
uh, maybe we are making choices about culture that we're not necessarily thinking about. It might be an unconscious choice. Okay, we might not realize the ramifications of that choice. Um, so it's interesting as we are looking at the examples in our book, uh, there's a point where it talks about using English for culture-free subjects. So subjects where they're not talking about the culture, but that they use the local language for culture-rich subjects. So an example would be um, in the Philippines, maybe they are teaching um, about the history of the Philippines in the Filipino dialect or whatever dialect for that region, um, either Tagalog or Cebuano or any other of a number of languages. Um, and they use that language as they're talking about the subjects, uh, writing, historical writings, um, also kind of writing for your culture, um, maybe art as well, if you're studying things about your culture. Um, they use the local language for those, uh, those subjects, and they use English for culture-free subjects. Uh, culture-free subjects are thought of to be the sciences and the math. Um, because we often use the same terms no matter what language we're in. Um, but the truth is we know that even math contains a bit of culture. The way we do math here in the United States is very different from the way they, they do math um, in, in the Far East, like Japan, or even in the Middle East. Um, some of the um, Arabic-speaking countries do math in a little bit different way from how we do in terms of the way they approach problem solving. Um, so I would say that there is no subject that is truly culture-free. Um, however, um, even here at the University of Utah, when we are advising international students of what courses we believe they should take um, in their first couple of semesters, we also try to give them um, we also try to give them courses uh, that are low in terms of the amount of linguistic uh, newness they'll have. So we often suggest math and chemistry uh, if those are subjects they're proficient in because they have a very low uh, language ability necessary to perform the tasks. Um, and we steer them away from what I would call a culture-rich subject like American institutions requirement um, because they, they likely have not studied the history of the United States uh, the way that someone who grew up in the United States has done. And so it becomes tricky for a language learner to learn both um, high, um, high language uh, necessity, right? So they're writing essays and things that they may never have written an essay in that way. Um, they're writing essays about something that they really haven't learned about or been exposed to until just now, where domestic students have been exposed to US history classes throughout their high school career. Okay, and so some of the things are new for those students, but the number of new things are small, where the number of new things for an international student is very large. Uh, so we often try to balance uh, schedules for international students when we're advising them um, as a university uh, so that they can have the support that they need um, to learn the language, to cover the subjects that they're studying, but not to overwhelm them too much with, um, with these culture culture-rich or language-rich subjects in English. So that's even a concept that prevails here. Okay. Um, as, we, as we look at kind of what this means, multilingualism in action, so it's important for us to remember that people can learn lots of languages. We don't only have to have one language. And as we can see from many environments, languages can coexist. Okay, we have also seen that languages can break up areas um, because language and culture are very important things uh, and often uh, conflict, the culture may conflict with the neighboring culture. Okay? Language choices impact people and their identity, meaning how they view themselves uh, in relation to the, their native language or their native culture and to the new, new language or new culture. So for example, when we choose to not use a native language in school, uh, we often are um, telling the child that that language is not a language we value. Um, and we may not mean it that way, but sometimes that's how the child interprets it. So children who come to the United States at some point often stop speaking their native language at home for a little while while they feel like English is the more important language. When the truth is you can speak them both. You don't have to choose just one. Okay. Um, it's also important for us to know that language issues can get really complicated. 
Okay, there are there are instances where you know language and culture issues are have caused wars or civil wars. Okay, um, then we have the issues um, I asked in one of your discussion questions, a, a question similar to this. But when we are talking about our own culture, can we represent our culture clearly uh, if we're using a different language, different from the language of our culture, right? So as English sort of takes over or um, it becomes used in all these different places, can English clearly represent all cultures? Uh, because many people say no. Uh, there are many other people who say yes, of course it can. And language can adapt to uh, put in other needs that it might have. And then we have a question of like, who does English belong to? Like who gets to make the decisions about what is good English or what English gets taught in school as we start to have these new varieties of English pop up? Um, so for example, here at the University of Utah, uh, when a student comes in as an international student and we ask them about their language status, we have many students who are sort of classified as English language learners even though they may come from a country where they personally learned English as their native language. Um, and so sometimes those issues can get a little bit confusing of do we count that as still speaking English? Okay, for example, students who come from India for whom Indian English is their native language often still benefit from a little bit of American English language instruction or pronunciation instruction to help them sort of navigate the hurdles of being in higher education uh, where we expect things to sound uh, more like American English or we expect our writing to look more like American English and not like Indian English.